It's only been six months and there's been a lot of cool things that have come out this year that I haven't specifically talked about either here or on a podcast or just in life. So I thought I'd just sit down with you guys. I hope you're sitting down. If you're standing up, maybe take a seat because this might be a long video because I have got 32. I know the title says 30. It just looks cleaner. 32 things from 2022 that I want to talk to you about and they're not ranked. Then how are you going to talk about them? I've got a wheel. Thanks to wheelofnames.com. Look at that wheel. I blurred the name so it's still a surprise. Let's spin that wheel. Let's surprise. Oh, starting strong, The Atom Project. There's already a review on this channel if you want to check it out. This is uh, basically young Ryan Reynolds, old Ryan Reynolds in a cool science fiction family film. I love it. I try to explain about how much I enjoy it to people and they're like, it's just dumb Netflix movie Ryan Reynolds. It is. And that's what makes it great. Staying on Netflix into the world of video games, The Cuphead Show, obviously based on a video game, it can kind of go either way. I think this got closer to being pretty good. It utilizes a lot of the iconography and kind of level design of the game and puts it through the filter of a fairly generic kids show. The levels that are focused on the bosses and progressing kind of the main arc of the show are pretty damn good. Whereas the other episodes where Cuphead and Mugman have to keep a baby safe and stuff like that that feel really generic and kind of they don't play into the world enough. They're also only like five, ten minutes each and so it's a pretty short season to burn through. If you're a fan of Cuphead or animation, I'd recommend it. Go see the film. It's really hard to talk about. You know it's good. If you didn't already know it's good, it is good. What can I say that doesn't spoil the film? The performances are all incredible. There's a lot of different things the actors have to do and they all kind of balance it really well. The visuals are incredible. Knowing that this is made by such a small team, I think there's three VFX artists that worked on this using predominantly at least Adobe products, which are kind of available to the public. It really warms my filmmaker heart and heart is very important to this film. It is. It will kick you in the nuts. And if you don't have a nuts, it'll kick you in the hearts. If you only have one heart, it'll just kick you in one of them. But if you have all of those things, you're gonna be in a lot of pain. Boy, 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 isn't in the film. And that's actually kind of the only thing I don't like about this movie. I really enjoyed this one. There's two paths that a video game film can take, being shit and being good. Also, another two paths, going direct adaptation or kind of doing your own thing. And this film, for the most part, does its own thing. There's definitely some checkboxes of wear a white shirt, have a gun. The fact that Mark Wahlberg works as Sully, that should be enough to make you want to watch this movie. Do you remember a scanner darkly? Total, 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 totally, total, total, total providence. No one does. Well, this is kind of like that. It's a fully animated version of that, but has that kind of live action uh, animation style to it. It's basically the story of a kid uh, during the Apollo 10 mission stuff in Houston in 1969. And it's kind of an all encompassing thing of what it was like being a kid during that era. There's actually a, far less space in it than you would assume from the title being a, a space age childhood. Now, I guess that's not really about the space age. It's about the childhood. The title is accurate. No one wants to talk about COVID in movies. We've kind of avoided it. And I think, uh, you know, if films start making fun and light of it, that will be a problem. There's another movie on this, this list that kind of takes the other angle. Kimmy uses the uh, kind of fear and isolation of the pandemic that we have gone through and are still going through uh, and turns it into a cool thriller. Zoe Kravitz is kind of a tech person looking through basically Siri and Google Home things and finding discrepancies where, you know, someone asked for them to play uh, Let It Be and they look up a brie and she's there to kind of fix the code and make sure that doesn't happen again. But she hears a kerfuffle and uh, investigates that. It's a light way of saying, Probable murder. I think this is better than the first one. There's a little bit more of the human -y stuff in this one in a way that is a little bit cringy, is a little bit grating, but the Sonic stuff in this is far more uh, video gamey and over the top. If this is Jim Carrey's final performance, my God, is it a performance? It is, to answer my question. 
Season four finished inside of July, so I'm not counting it in this first year, but God, it was a good season. The Boys Diabolical is kind of a Love, Death and Robots anthology series of things that could exist in the universe, but uh, kind of ties more directly to the original comics. The art style of a lot of them follows closely uh, of those things, to the extent of one of the episodes having Simon Pegg voice Huey, because of course in the comics, that's who Huey is based on. Then Simon Pegg played the dad. But this is very good. There is some cool stories that I wish the show would really do that lean harder into the superhero elements. I mean, there's a Justin Ryland Rick and Morty-esque episode, and I don't always love that style, but it may be my favorite episode in this thing. I hope there's a season two. Oh, this is so close to being cool. Literally two thirds of this thing are really intensely uh, stylized heist action thing with Catwoman. There was something weird where my mouth just said, I'm sorry. And then shit hits the fan on the third and it kind of gets a little bit too weird, which is also something I think a lot of these animated films do. Um, the voice acting is incredible as per usual. There's some great cameos uh, or, from across the um, DC universe. I'm not sure if this one is based on a direct comic. Uh, sometimes they do it, sometimes it's an original story. Uh, I enjoyed this. I definitely enjoyed this, but it's a solid three star for just how weird it gets at the end, but worth a watch. With every passing season, there's only been three, of Love, Death and Robots, I think more and more of the show feels a bit silly, but I do think the highs of this season are greater than the lows, and uh, that kind of isn't always the case. There's some really good episodes, our first ever sequel with the three robots from season one, wonderful. Uh, there's a great episode of um, rats infesting a barn, and the old man that owns the barn is voiced by, voiced by Craig Ferguson. Oh, oh. Was that the right reaction to that? I don't know. But yeah, I think there's a lot of fluff in this, a lot of stories that feel incredibly similar. There's a episode called The Swarm, and then Josh and I sat there and realized that almost every episode in the season had a swarm. Oh my God, Stranger Things season four. I um, am now devoted to this show. I wasn't too sure where I sat with Stranger Things. Season one is obviously iconic and is the reason Netflix is still on the planet. Season two was a more character focused thing that I think lost the plot. Season three was great for the Scoops troupe, but I also think that that show, the season was a little bit messy and I think the Russian line is kind of the only bit that I remember. But season four brings everything that has happened before and uh, wraps it up in a really nice, tight plot. The performances are next level. I don't think there is another show, maybe The Boys, that has uh, more consistent, amazing actors that, oh God, make me cry. I do think some characters get left alone a little bit too much and I would have liked to have seen their stories lifted, especially Will, Mike, Jonathan. Um, but season five is gonna be something and uh, I really didn't expect to be excited for another season of this show, but now I'm excited for another season of the show and also buying anything Stranger Things related. There's been so many films this year that I can't really talk about in full because I feel like I'll spoil it, but Fresh stars Daisy Edgar Jones and Sebastian Stan. And it's a beautiful film. For some of it, then the title drops and the tone changes a whole heap. I haven't seen Pam and Tommy yet, but I think this is my favorite Sebastian Stan performance. He, uh, he's very creepy. There is maybe a, an element of triggering in terms of Maybe not body horror, but uh, uh, you know, it's very stalkerish and a very uh, kind of uncomfortable film, but also a little bit funny. A little bit funny. <sighs> all right, all right, all right, all right. I know I haven't talked about this show. I liked some of it. I just think that there wasn't a reason that it existed. And this is coming from someone who loves Solo, a Star Wars story. Solo A Star Wars Story is my second favorite Star Wars thing. And this just felt like you had Ewan McGregor, you had Hayden Christensen, you had a bunch of brilliant new actors as well. Moses Ingram, this show isn't sticking around in my brain. I just think as a story, it was a little bit confused and just tread water for a lot of the time. Most of the episodes boiled down to Leia has been taken, we got her back now someone else has her. And that's just not an interesting thing, especially when Ewan McGregor's giving it 110%, man. My God, is he an actor? Again, I'll answer the question that I posed. He is. It's good. You know it's good. Everyone knows it's good. Move on. It's funny, because you see, Jewel, spelled D-U-A-L, means two. And this film's about clones of people. But 
you also have to duel, D-U-E-L, your clone. This movie's f***ing weird. The director, Riley Stearns, uh, seemingly in all his films, directs his actors to be very odd. Everyone's very off kilter, which comes across as bad a lot of the time, but by the end of the film, it kind of is the world. It's the universe of this thing, is that everyone's a little bit cringy in their performances, which for some people, it's gonna be hard to watch. Even as a fan of Karen Gillan, and you know I'm a fan of Karen Gillan. Hello. <laughs> Hi. It was really difficult to watch. Do you really want to? Do you really want to die there? <laughs> I never learnt the dance. John Cena is phenomenal in this series. He puts in such an incredible performance, and I really wish that he could have everything Dwayne The Rock Johnson has. A show with fart jokes and dick jokes make me cry. And I hated those dicks and fart jokes at the start. I didn't think I was gonna get through this season, but all the characters, apart from, you know, villains, are so endearing that those silly farts and dick jokes, they feel like you're friends by the end of the show. It also feels incredibly low budget in the best way. Nothing feels overblown and silly until you know, it needs to be. And I know I've said a lot about John Cena. Everyone in this show is great on both the comedy side and the dramatic side. It's a brilliant show and it is actually worth your time. Don't worry. If you're like me and you're like, I don't know if I'll enjoy this, you might. Season three was shot in the heart of COVID. I understand that a lot of things had to be changed. It is basically a one set show by the end of it. Despite that, they've done great. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening, but it just feels like they didn't know what they wanted to make. There's obviously a lot of character work because they couldn't do big set pieces and I enjoyed a lot. The changes made to Diego uh, are fun. Luther, uh, it's just a very basic, boring romance plot with him that kind of takes up a little bit too much of the show. But the highlight and star of the show is Elliot Page. Um, uh, the transition from Vanya to Victor is phenomenally handled. Uh, it, it made me cry. It just feels like a family. They feel like family. Uh, and it's it's wonderful seeing it play out on screen. But on the whole, it definitely felt like the weakest season of the three. But, uh, you know, spending time with the characters does mean that I'm intrigued and hopeful for the future uh, for season four. Uh, this movie's fun. It's pulpy. It's a little bit over the top. Uh, and it has kind of a loose grasp on reality, which for something like this is, is pretty damn good. Chippendale Rescue Rangers is, is very much what the trailers sell you it as. It's the characters of a show in the real world that is full and populated with other animated properties. And it doesn't feel like a cash-in. It doesn't feel like a Ready Player One. It does feel like a lived-in universe, which is sick. And the plot of the film, or at least the hook, is also really cool. The idea of off-brand remakes and bootlegs of official properties and like stealing characters to make them. It's really cool. And it plays into the universe in a fun way. Uh, all the animation's great. I really enjoyed it on first watch, but Looking back through it now, you can tell that it is kind of 3D models replicating original 2D animation, and it's a bit unfortunate. There's some odd choices made. Also, the Peter Pan uh, origin story being the real-life tragic story of the voice actor from the original film. It's a funny bit until you realize it's real, and then it's uncomfortable for the rest of the film. It's just one of those ones that the more you think about it, the more problems arise. But go in, have some fun. Hopefully I've set that bar just a little lower, and now you can just hop over it and have a little, have a little Chippendale fun. <laughs> I've done that noise before, but I'm doing it again. For me, my favorite element of the show was the Boba Fett lost in the sand dunes with the Tuscans. I know that some people wanted to get back to the plot, but the plot was pretty boring. Boba Fett wanting to become like a head crime leader could be cool, but the show was doing it in a very traditional sense of meetings and like slight backstabbing, but like really not much was happening in the present. And then of course Mandalorian takes over the show and yes, chapter five is the best episode of the show, whichever one was his full story. But why? I hadn't seen season one of Russian Doll, but I saw that season two had come out this year. So I binged season one, knowing Josh had seen season one and I went, I'll leave season two so we can watch it together. I then binge season two in the same day. Season one was kind of a time loopy thing. There's a lot of uh, elements of time travel. Incredible season one, definitely well worth a watch. Season two is a very different idea. 
this is the thing I don't want to spoil because I actually think having watched season one and, and expecting a certain thing, season two flips that on its head. It's still a little bit time loopy and travel-y, um, so it kind of fits the universe, but it's far more eccentric and far more weird. So uh, well worth a watch. I've said that a few times. Don't tell me I say it a lot in the comments. I don't need to be told that I've only got like a few catchphrases. Push the buttons. There's a snake in my boot. Oh, we're really getting to the big stuff now. I actually really enjoyed this. Josh and I watched it on a night when we were waiting for hot chips. It's all we were waiting for. It took six hours. They said that it was delivered. It never arrived. And the movie was crazy too. Jake Gyllenhaal is like the epitome of a Jake Gyllenhaal unhinged character. And I always forget that that's his thing until I watch a Gyllenhaal movie and then I'm like, I don't know if I want to be your friend or call the police. It's also a Michael Bay movie, so the action of it is top tier. I think this is one of his better films in recent years as well. There's a lot of creative decisions in the action set pieces, as well as a very hard reliance on drones, which sometimes works. Sometimes it like flies over a building and you're like, oh, it's about to build into a cool shot. And then it just cuts away and it's like, oh, so you just did a cool drone shot. I'm sitting low. It's a fun movie. It's full of dumb action and uh, yeah, just switch it on when you're waiting for hot chips. This is another one of those movies. What can I say that hasn't been said? I'll say this. I'm not huge into the original film. I probably watched it growing up once. And so going to see this one, I didn't have much nostalgia. I definitely picked up on all the little fun little, little things for the fans. But I think not having that extra layer has prevented me from loving the film as much as I think a lot of people did. The action is insane. Films have kind of trained our brains to see CGI for everything. And so it's not until you watch the behind the scenes that you really are impressed that things are really happening in that film. They're actual actors in cockpits. I'm also not a huge Tom Cruise fan. I don't generally aim to watch any of his films, uh, but this one was getting so much cool press. I had to go see it. And I do think the bits where he's just talking are the worst parts of the film. I love it when anyone is in a plane. I've been told it's a very like 80s, early 90s feeling to a film where nothing's too important. And like, I get that, but it's like I was watching an AI write a script in between the cool action. I appreciate it. I'm sure if I had a love of Top Gun, I would love it even more, but it's not quite the best film of the year that a lot of people are toting. All of Us Are Dead is basically the first thing I watched this year. It's a K-drama zombie series. There is a lot of padding in this thing, a lot of kind of good old fashioned, oh, we're almost out, we're not out, oh, damn. But when it gets to the heart of a lot of the characters, it hurts. I do think this is the most emotional I've felt in a kind of zombie thing. There's a lot of zombie content over the past 20 years. So it's very uh, weird that I enjoyed this. I wasn't expecting to, I thought it would be incredibly tropey. It is, but through those tropes, it adds a lot more connection. There's a lot of family, there's a lot of uh, friendships. It's also an incredibly well-constructed show. There's a lot of elements that are seated that come back in a larger way than you would kind of expect, which I love, especially in a television series that's I think like 12 episodes long, and they're also all about an hour. So having it feel in incredibly connected and, and well-woven together was a great thing. This is a little creepy movie. There's not much I can really say about it. It's rear window style. Someone's watching you, someone's stalking you. Uh, there's nothing too original about it, but it's a well put together film and uh, has a good bit of tension. Doth you know about Station Eleven? This is a weird show. I think it's my favorite thing I've watched this year, but I also hate theater students. I was one. Set kind of post-apocalyptic level thing. There's two timeline stories going on at the same time. A younger version of our protagonist kind of living through the first days and months of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and then the future, which is a world ravaged and barren, but there's like a little traveling company performing Shakespeare. It's also kind of a Westworld level of like, we're real smart. We're talking about emotions in a very deep way, uh, but probably not really if you think about it. It's kind of basic. And for dumb people, it makes us feel smart. The performances are also heart-wrenching. Uh, Hamish Patel, I don't know how he's not in more things. He is second to Mackenzie Davis, or maybe single tier, uh, the best thing about this show. And I wish, I wish he was in more of it. You know how like chocolate 
exists. I'm sure you do. And there's like a lot of different versions of chocolate. And deep down, whenever you buy a Mars bar or a Milky Way, you're like, really? It's, it's just chocolate. There's cool stuff on the inside, but it's generally the same. The Northman's like chocolate, but it's in like the coolest packaging you've ever seen. It's like lenticular and has like 3D bevels on it and it just looks really, really cool. And you slip it out and you're like, oh man, I'm still eating chocolate. But you're like, it looked really good. It's a generic Norse Viking story of man that wants revenge for his parents. And it never really does anything on top of that. But visually, it is phenomenal. The amount of kind of weirdness that was able to be infused into what is a fairly stereotypical film uh, was wonderful. Obviously, it pulls a lot from Norse lore, including Bjork, famously a big mythological creature, and just kind of plays with it and makes that kind of simple story flourish. The performances are also incredible, of course. A Skarsgård, a Taylor Joy, uh, all wonderful in the film. And uh, yeah, I think that with a, a lesser director and a lesser cast, this could have been fairly generic, but it's proof that a simple story can be simple if you wrap it in some good looking lenticular chocolate wrapping paper. I think I enjoyed this one. It's a, a funny one that grows and wears on me the more I think and watch it. My one thing which I will always say is that the name is wrong. It shouldn't be called Multiverse of Madness. Obviously the multiverse is present, but it's not really about the multiverse. It's a story about Strange realizing it's not about him, about self-discovery for America Chavez, about Wanda realizing it's not all about her as well. And the multiverse is a nice backdrop, but I think plastering it on all the posters maybe set up a precedent and an expectation for a lot of us that the film never intended on hitting. It's not my favorite Marvel film, but there is a lot of Marvel films and it's okay if one of them isn't my favorite Marvel film. If it's yours, I'm glad. There are four things left. One of them's Morbius. Is Morbius going to be the last thing I talk about? This isn't planned. Yeah, this film's a delight. It's Pedro Pascal and Nicolas Cage. I don't... What more do you want? The plot is all in the trailers, but funnily enough, the film actually makes use of its promotional material. You'll see when you watch the movie, there's a scene where Pedro Pascal is talking about trailer shots and he does something in the film and that shot is then used in the trailer as the trailer shot. And it's just fun meta commentary that you need to have absorbed all the promotional material. It's weird. It's obviously incredibly different to it, but it feels like Shane Black, the nice guys level fun. And uh, it's just a delight. I didn't really grow up with the Jackass films and series. I definitely was aware of them and maybe watched a few clips with my cousin or something. Um, so this was the kind of the first film I've seen in full at the cinema. And it's pretty fun. There's not much, I can't critique Jackass. It's not a thing that exists for crit crit critiquing. I swear to God, these are the worst two films of the last six months. Oh, that's so funny. The Bubble. What can I say about the bubble? It's a Judd Apatow film, but it's a modern Judd Apatow film. This movie is bad, man. But I liked it. <laughs> it's got Karen Gillan and Pedro Pascal and a lot of people that I just didn't expect to be in this movie. But I do think there's some clever comedy in this. I think this is a better Judd Rapatum Tum film than a lot of the ones he's made recently. This is also the flip side of Kimmy where it's using COVID in a big way, saying the word COVID and making a joke of it. I don't want anyone else to do this. And I, th I think this is it. This is the film where you make fun of COVID or you make fun of the bubble and kind of all that stuff because it's also about what you know the filmmaking industry was like during this time. Never do it again. This is the only film that needs to exist of it and even this isn't that great. Oh, what's it gonna be? Why does it still spin? It's just Morbius. <laughs> what's it gonna be? Morbius. I did a full review of this. This is one of three movies I did a full review of. If you want my opinion on this movie, go see it. No, don't go see the movie. <laughs> Watch my review. So yeah. Morbius isn't good. That's it. Thank you for watching it. I hope I gave you some suggestions and recommendations of things that you can wrap your little eyes around or big eyes. It's been a great year for film and TV so far, so I'm excited to see what else comes out in the back half of the year. Thanks for bearing with me. See you soon.